Mm -hmm. Okay, I got some ideas. Okay, take it away. Bye. Bye. Okay. All righty, here we go again. I can get my stopwatch straightened out here. <laughs> All righty, this is the last message in the First Corinthians series. I didn't even keep track. I could look it up. It's been probably two and a half, three months, maybe. We've been working on this. It's a big book, uh, 16 chapters. Actually, it's a letter. Originally, it was a letter. Um, Paul had helped establish uh, this church by preaching the gospel. And um, had a great response. Many people coming out of pagan uh, backgrounds, most of them, or Jewish backgrounds. Uh, there's a, a Jewish um, synagogue in Corinthians and many temples to different gods. So a lot of these people, except for the Jewish people, had some understanding, of course, the, certainly of the Old Testament. Uh, Paul was starting from square one and, uh, and going against the stream um, because most people believed in several different gods, even the emperor's god. And the city was full of uh, sexual immorality. And uh, so he has had to, as we, those of you that have been with me throughout these uh, several months have seen, he has had his hands full with this church time and again. He's paragraph after paragraph, dealing <clears throat> with different issues about uh, what was going on there in uh, in Corinth. So we're going to finish this today. Uh, he's going to try trying to tie some loose ends together in finishing this letter. And uh, so we'll look at that in just a bit. Uh, before we do, um, I'd just like to do something a little different. Um, I don't have as much material today, but I want to do something meaningful. So uh, first of all, I want to give you just a short devotional from Grace for the Moment, Volume 2, Max Licato. Um, these, uh, all these devotions that he has in this one-year book are taken from about 14 different books he's written. They're excerpts. <clears throat> so we'll look at that now. And then I want to give you just a, a brief uh, outline as to what we're going to do in the future. And we'll get on with Corinthians. Okay, so the place of prayer. This was taken from um, February 10th of this year. Um, and um, I'm going to have to put this light on here because the, hold on for just a minute. I'm just going to keep this on for this part. The place of prayer. They went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. This is the book of Acts. Um, they all continued praying together. Okay. And that's taken from the book of Acts, chapter 1, 12, and 14. <clears throat> so, this is what Max was inspired to write by the Lord. Desire power for your life? It will come as you pray. For 10 days, the disciples pray. 10 days of prayer, plus a few minutes of preaching, led to 3,000 saved lives. Perhaps we today invert the numbers. We're prone to pray for a few minutes and preach for 10 days. Not the apostles. Like the boat waiting for uh, China, I'm sorry, like the boat waiting for Christ, they lingered in his presence. They never left the place of prayer. The upper room was occupied by 120 disciples. Since there were about 4 million people in Palestine at that time, 
This means that fewer than one in 30,000 was a Christian. You look at the fruit of their work. Better said, look at the fruit of God's Spirit in them. We can only wonder what would have ha would happen today if we, who still struggle, did what they did. Wait on the Lord in the right place. So preaching and teaching are exceedingly important, and Paul talks about that in, uh, in Corinthians. But you're not going to get very far, as great as those things are, unless you have bathed it in prayer. So, something very wonderful has happened. I've been praying for this for 30 years, maybe more. Um, I have been saying that our country is unraveling. It is. Morally, spiritually, financially, in every way, our country is not like it was. Now, we had some bad things in the past we need to fix, and I think we've made some progress on some things, and that's good. It's not all bad. But there's a lot of bad teaching, a lot of things that people are believing today that are erroneous, and certainly not of not the truth and not of the Christian faith. And that's very disturbing. We're passing laws and things that are crippling people and destroying people's lives and in this country. Well, let's not get into all of that. So I've been saying for 30, maybe longer than that, years, we have needed a biblical spiritual revival. I believe it was, I'm going to have to see if I can, I still have the book, One Divine Moment, a book about uh, a revival that occurred in modern times, my lifetime, 1970, at Asbury College in Wilmore, Kentucky. Um, it had happened three years before I got there at the seminary across the street, Asbury Theological Seminary. What happened? Um, basically and shortly, the, they had these chapel services at the college. It's about 1,200 kids, I think, were enrolled at the time. And they would have these services and they would have missionaries come in and speak and some of the professors would speak and for some reason the, the I guess the class president had an opportunity to speak for a few minutes and he got up and he said I am a phony everybody looked at him I'm a phony everybody here thinks I'm the greatest Christian I'm such a nice guy and a great Christian I'm a phony I'm a Christian, but not a very good one. And he went on to, 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 to tell the people that he had sinned. And the Holy Spirit fell. People started coming up, even professors, and confessing their sin. People were, the altar flooded out with students. The Spirit fell. The, the gifts of the Spirit that Paul talks about were present. People were being healed. Marriages were being saved that were on the rocks. People that um, owed money to the local grocer who had no intention of paying came in and paid. All kinds of fantastic things happened. And this revival kept going for over seven days. People were driving from, I heard one situation where a guy drove 900 miles from, from Boston, Massachusetts. He got wind of this and drove all the way down to be part of this revival. It went 24-7 for these seven days. It was just amazing what happened. Many of these kids were saved. Many of these kids uh, were called to ministry. Many of them became missionaries. Um, they went all over the world teaching the gospel and preaching the gospel from what happened at that revival. And then I arrived there three years later. And uh, so there was still the glow from that amazing revival. 
um, I had the privilege of being there now, three years later, but still could feel the presence. Um, well, here's some good news. All the bad news in the world. Asbury College is at it again. <laughs> Maybe I should say the Lord is at it again because there are, it's been going, I, I'm going to have to read, I, I haven't had a chance to research it, but I know as of, I think Thursday had been going on for eight days, people from all over the world were trying to get there to this. The Lord was doing something amazing again. We need this so badly in this world and in our country. We're in serious trouble. And this is a hope. God's doing an amazing thing. And I hope and pray that this will turn a lot of our young, wonderful young people around and, and turn them back to him. Um, I don't want to say anything more. I could go on and on. I spent the whole 30 minutes on that. Okay, so let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to, to finish 1 Corinthians uh, today. Thank you for this amazing book. We've learned so much. It's it's real stuff. It's not all happy, 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 joyful, joyful, joyful. Paul is dealing with real life, uh, painful, difficult situations uh, in this church that, that you uh, launched through him and his compatriots. And uh, he is trying his best uh, to help them uh, right the ship. And... Um, we thank you, Lord, in our time. We also are in desperate straits, but we're hoping that things like the Asbury Revival and other things that you are doing will bring many of our young people and all of our people uh, back to you or be drawn to you, that we might help this country recover from what has been happening here. So we thank you and praise you for that. Make this time fruitful in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I took a lot of time doing that. <laughs> so let me tell you, um, in the weeks to come, the next six weeks will be in the Lenten season. Uh, next Wednesday, which is, uh, what, six, five days from now, will be Ash Wednesday. Uh, during those six weeks that lead up to Easter, <clears throat> we're going to do six messages or teachings on things, ways of living life that you don't want to be doing. You may recognize yourself in one of these. And if so, you need to take steps. I need to take steps to get this garbage out of our lives. Um, these, are the six, these are six ways in which you do not want to live. During the Lenten season, we take inventory to see um, how we're doing. And we can say to the Lord, okay, Lord, I'm falling short here. Please help me to do better. Send your Holy Spirit to help me. Most of these, five out of six of these messages, the main text is from the New Testament. Actually, the last one from the Old Testament. <clears throat> these are the titles. The way of the fighter. Do you find yourself arguing and fighting with people all the time? The way of the escapist. Or you live in dream world. Um, you're not facing reality. The way of the self-righteous. Well, I'm better than everybody else. <laughs> Boy, that's ugly, isn't it? The way of the materialist. There's no spirituality. And we, we tend to think of everything as just being a material world. The way of the compromiser. Where you compromise everything, including your faith. And the way of the manipulator, which is a nasty one, because you're manipulating people any way you can to get what you want. The, the last one in the series will be after Easter, and that will be um, the way of the Christian. Ah, what a contrast. Okay, so <laughs> having said all that, let's go on here. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 24. This will finish our series. And here's what is being written to end this this letter. Be on your guard. He's been saying that throughout the letter. Be on your guard. Oh, Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeing whom he can devour. Be on your guard. Don't go to sleep. Keep your head up. 
and watch because Satan is constantly trying to do stuff to mess people up, including us. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Don't let anything water down your faith. Oh, science says, or oh, so-and-so, and somebody gives an amazing teaching. If it does not square with the scripture, don't include that in your philosophy and in your theology. Stand firm in your faith. You know the gospel. Stand on it. Do not compromise it. And I can tell you, I have done that all 50, almost 50 years now. If this, well, tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll be 50 years in the Lord. I have taken a beating sometimes emotionally from people in my churches. But I, I can say I've probably gotten some things wrong, a lot of things wrong maybe. But I have stood on the gospel and I have not compromised it. And I will not to my grave. Um, please do not compromise your faith. Do not let anybody water it down. That's what Paul's saying to these people. He's saying it to you and me, God speaking through him. Be men, be women of courage. Courage. It takes courage to stand when everybody else says, you're a fool. You believe that stuff? Yes, I do. Be strong. Do everything, though, in love. So there's a balance. You're strong. Jesus was strong. And yet everything he did was out of love. And he kept it in perfect balance. That's what we need to strive for. Be strong in the faith. Do not compromise it. But at the same time, lovingly tell them the truth. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Acacia. And they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. There's a wonderful household. They probably took the, the uh, apostles in. They supported them financially. They gave them food. They did anything they could to further the gospel. Whether you preach, teach, or do have some other gift, do whatever you can to further the gospel to whomever you can, because the time is growing short. I urge you, brothers, to submit to such as these and so everyone who joins in the, the work and labors at it, <clears throat> anybody that you can support who's doing missionary work, um, preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel, or, we, or be glad when somebody you're doing that and somebody supports you, that's a good thing. Be glad for it and continue to stand firm. I was glad when Stephanus Fortunatus and Archaeus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. <clears throat> With all the wealth and everything going on in that city, shame on the Corinthian church. They should have taken good care of Paul and his staff. They should have made sure he had room and board, that he had good meals um, to eat so he could keep his strength up as he preached night and day the gospel. They should have taken care of all of his needs. When um, I used to have missionary conferences in my church, sometimes it was just our church, and we would have a missionary come in for the weekend. Um, and we, we put them up and made sure they had good food. They had plenty of opportunities to speak. We did everything we could and sent them away with, with money to help them with their mission. Um, sometimes I, I, I was um, involved with two or three other pastors and churches where we would have a round robin uh, missions weekend, which was fantastic. We had four or five different mission missionaries. And uh, we'd have missionary A uh, Friday night and uh, for breakfast uh, Saturday morning, missionary B, and maybe uh, and that night, and then for missionary C uh, Sunday morning. It was just amazing. And then they would go on to the, around, they would go around the churches. And we would do everything we could to support the great missionary work that uh, brothers and sisters are doing. And it was, it was very exciting for us, the congregation, to see their slides and artifacts and things that they were doing in these various countries. So 
it's always an exciting thing to, to support missions work. Well, the Corinthians should have done a better job, perhaps. But these men that he's uh, talking about here and their households made sure that whatever was lacking, they made up for. For they refreshed my spirit and yours also. So again, do all you can. If you're a pastor, if you go to a different church, uh, speaking the gospel, do all you can to support him or her and their family. Make sure they have everything they need. Because I know from 38 years experience, it is not easy. If you really preach the gospel, it's not easy. The devil doesn't like it. And he will make your life very difficult at times. And he's not going to go just after the pastor. He will go over the after the pastor's family. So do all you can to encourage them and strengthen them. We have a wonderful pastor, Pastor Nova here, and, and Justin and Nicole, um, uh, make them when he's here. Um, bless them any way you can. And pray. Like we said in the beginning of this, pray. Pray for the church. Pray for them. Pray for their ministry. Such, such men deserve recognition. And we can now say such men and women deserve such recognition. Um, the churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. I am given to understand that both Aquila and Priscilla preached the gospel. This was a husband-wife team. So a man and a woman preached the gospel, taught the gospel in their home. And he's praying for uh, support, um, at least in prayer, if nothing else, for Aquila and Priscilla. Um, he's very, very, very appreciative of their ministry. And they were very a great help to Paul. Um, and they, in turn, because they had been with Paul in Corinth, are offering um, their greetings. All the brothers here send you greetings. Again, remember, Paul didn't just come into the city by himself. He came in with Priscilla and Aquila and Timothy and a bunch of other folks who gave testimony about the Lord and, and preached and taught to, and helped start the Corinthian church. And now they are off in probably Ephesus. Uh, they're off in another place helping that church. They would move around and help the different churches. Sometimes they'd stay for months at a given church to help that church get off the ground and continue to grow in grace. Paul, as we have learned, is hoping to get back to the Corinthian church because of all these problems. Um, and he's hoping to um, right the ship in areas where they're, they're messing up and address some of these problems in person. Um, Paul goes on, greet one another with a holy kiss. Okay. So, of course, in ancient times and in Europe even, men kiss each other on the cheeks uh, women kiss each other on the cheeks. There's that kind of, in other words, it's a, a show of affection, a show of brotherly or sisterly love, especially in the faith. But whatever way that we express it, a hug, um, words, we, we want to express love for one another. It's a wonderful world, but it can be a really mean world sometimes. Isn't it wonderful when somebody, you come to church or to a church meeting and there's people there that greet you and, and give you a hug. So how are you doing? I'm so glad to see you today. I love that when people do that for me and I try to do that for others as well. Um, whenever somebody comes to our church, I try to go out of my way to make them feel comfortable and know that, that we love them. I don't care what they look like, who they are. 
And I just want them to know that we're glad they're there and that they're a child of God like anybody else. So that's an important ministry. I'm sure you've been, I've been to churches, maybe we're visiting in another city or something, and it felt like, did anybody even realize I was here? <laughs> Nobody said a word to us. You know, maybe somebody looked at us, but they never know. So this is a cold church. This is not what church is supposed to be. It should be a place of great welcoming and, and love and kindness. I Now, this is interesting. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Um, this may be um, a reference to his thorn in the flesh. Many, many have written about the possibilities of Paul's thorn in the flesh, stomach problems, and all this. But one that has come to the fore, I think, is it, it appears that he may well have had eye problems, um, sight problems, and um, his his eyes had grown weak. Um, so he's very proud here because he is writing at least this greeting in my own hand. So he's writing some of the, these words um, by his own sight and hand. And he's very thankful for even that little bit. Um, probably most of this letter was written by an amanuensis. Amenu what? Amanuensis. In other words, the Greek word for secretary. And he probably had another um, person, part of his group, that he dictated this letter to. But here he's very happy because he's writing this greeting in his own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. Um, really? That's what is that's what it, it is. Uh, we are all, when we were we came into this world, we came under the threat of, of, of death because of sin. The sin on humankind, the curse of Adam is upon us. When we came to know Christ, the sin, the um, curse was lifted. And we were now under the blessing of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness. Um, so we must take great pity. No, not just pity, compassion on those that don't know Christ. They are under the curse of Adam. They need That needs to be lifted from them. We want them to be part of our family. It's why the gospel is so important. We need to live it in, in front of people and speak it and let the Holy Spirit work in us. So, you know, everyone who knows not the Lord is under a curse. Come, O Lord, Maranatha um, is another way of saying it. Maybe you've heard that phrase. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord. Um, he's wanting the second coming to come, and they didn't know. They thought even in the first century, Jesus possibly could come back. <clears throat> excuse me, there's 2,000 years now that have elapsed. Uh, the longer he waits, the more people that will be saved and be in the kingdom. So that's a good thing. Um, I trust that the world is going to have to get a whole lot nastier and, and difficult before he's going to come back. But when it gets really bad, <laughs> he'll be back. May not be in our lifetime, could if things unravel quick, quickly, but he's coming back. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. See, he doesn't want to, he's not issuing a curse, he's wishing a blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. The gospel is about the love of God. God is love. Let's pray. We only have a few seconds left. Lord, thank you for allowing us to, to review and understand a little bit better the, um, the um, 
wonderful um, letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. And we pray, Lord, that uh, we will learn from this and grow in grace and um, be all that you have us to be, that we might bring glory to your name in the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you next time.